Remember the history. Do not forget what they did to Diana. Mm. When Diana was breaking and, you know, in serious mental distress, but she wasn't mad because they were treating her so badly. And actually, just last week, one of Jefferson, I think, said that they leaked all this information about Diana. I remember Nicholas Soames saying on Newsnight, you know, she's, she's crazy because she did not let Charles own the narrative mm -hmm. because she wanted to tell her side of the story. Yeah. And they leaked that she was mad and they destroyed this woman's mental health. Then I was unwell with postnatal depression. Was this completely out of character for you? Yes, very much so. I've never had a, never had had a depression in my life. But then when I analysed it, I could see that the changes I'd made in the last year had all caught up with me. And my body had said, we want a rest. But I knew myself that actually what I needed was space and time to adapt to all the different roles that had come my way. I knew I could do it, but I needed people to be patient and give me the space to do it. Well, it was a very short space of time. In, in a space of a year, my whole life had changed, turned upside down. And it had its wonderful moments, but it also had challenging moments. And I could see where the rough edges needed to be smoothed. Well, it gave everybody a wonderful new label. It's Diana's unstable and Diana's um, mentally imbalanced. And unfortunately, that seems to have stuck on and off over the years. I think people used it and it's stuck. Yes. What was so wicked is she was framed as, as being so immature. When what, what gaslighting that is when she was chosen because she was immature, essentially. That was why she was picked. And I don't mean immature as an insult. I mean, quite literally, she was still a teenager. <laughs> you know, she, she, wasn't, she wasn't at that later point in her life. So she couldn't really advocate for herself. And she came from a family that was extremely troubled, extremely troubled. And they must have known that way that she was kind of groomed so young to go into that role when quite clearly Charles and Camilla were in their 30s and, and planning to basically just use her as, you know, oh, you'll be the public face. But she wasn't in on it. You know, she really did think that this was a love situation and she hadn't had boyfriends before. And this is not a video for me to get angry about what was done to Diana, but she hadn't had boyfriends before. The girls that Charles dated that had had boyfriends before, they didn't want to be with him because they were more aware. You know, she was the perfect victim. It, it was really horrible. When no one listens to you or you feel no one's listening to you, all sorts of things start to happen. For instance, you have so much pain inside yourself that you try and hurt yourself on the outside because you want help. So, I, uh, yes, I did inflict that upon myself. I didn't like myself. I was ashamed that I couldn't cope with the pressures. Well, I just hurt my arms and my legs. I had bulimia for a number of years. And that's like a secret disease. You inflict it upon yourself because your self-esteem is to low ebb and you don't think you're worthy or valuable. It was a symptom of what was going on in my marriage. I was crying out for help and people were using my bulimia as a coat on a hanger. They decided that was the problem. Diana was unstable. The cause was a situation where we, my husband and I had to keep everything together because we didn't want to disappoint the public. And yet, obviously, there was a lot of anxiety going on within our four walls. That the situation she was in was high stress. She wasn't treated with kindness. There was huge stigma. The environment was not healing or affirming. In fact, in some ways it was dismissive and cruel and she was very alone. So it made her so much worse. And this is how the cycle works. And, I and it's a terrible trick that happens in these situations because the person going through the abuse, they reach out for help. They might develop unhealthy coping strategies. So Diana developed bulimia because she didn't feel in control of her environment and she didn't feel any love. And then because she had bulimia, she was then shamed and the bulimia was used as an excuse, right? So it was like, oh, actually, Diana's just mad. Look, she's got bulimia. In fact, she's causing all the problems here. Do you see how that evil cycle works? Rampant bulimia, if you can have rampant bulimia, and just a feeling of being no good at anything and being useless and hopeless and failed in every direction. And with a husband who was having a relationship with somebody else? Was a husband who loved someone else, yes. It was already difficult, but it became increasingly difficult. I say people, and I mean friends on my husband's side were indicating that I was, again, unstable 
um, sick and should be put in an, a home of some sort in order to get better. Well, there's no better way to dismantle a personality than to isolate it. So you were isolated? Mm-hmm. Very much so. And she was dismissed as mad. So she was living in this Kafkaesque world where she could see the truth and everybody was denying the truth. It gives you some idea actually of how sane she was if I tell you that she reacted to some of the, the rumours that were started about her own mental health um, with humour. I can remember going to a, uh, uh, a fundraising lunch that she was speaking at and picking up something that had been in that morning's headlines. Uh, she said, um, I hope that I'll be allowed to get to the end of my speech before the men in white coats come to take me away. Uh, this, of course, produced uh, lots of laughter. I'm supposed to have my head down the loo for most of the day. <laughs> I'm supposed to be dragged off in a minute with men in white coats. So, so if it's all right with you, I thought I might postpone my nervous breakdown to a more appropriate moment. <laughs> I can honestly say, as somebody that worked with Diana for as long as I did, and prior to that, I worked with her two young sons, I saw Diana as a very level-headed individual, working under extreme difficulties, not least of all because of the public life that she was leading, but also within the framework of a very unhappy marriage. I never saw any evidence of somebody that was unstable, mad or paranoid. If Diana was another truth teller. Diana was a threat because she had emotional intelligence and she had charisma and whether or not people like Diana I think you can acknowledge that she thought about things from quite an emotional lens you know she had emotional awareness she did have that kind of humanity she was very charismatic you know people connected to her and they liked her people kind of combat the truth teller in advance sometimes so it's extremely difficult before that truth teller has even come into their own and become confident they're kind of smacked with these labels before they can do it so before the truth teller even realizes and for sure i think it seems that the royal family understood that diana could be a threat if she ever came into her own power if she ever got her own voice if she advocated for herself if she had support I was portrayed in the media at that time, if I remember rightly, as someone, because I hadn't passed any O-levels and taken any A-levels, I was stupid. And I made the grave mistake in order to ease the child's nervousness, of which it did. But it, that headline went all around the world, and I rather regret saying it. <laughs> this was another label that was put onto Diana, and, you know, abuse victims will, go, will play into this themselves, because you don't have high self-esteem, but also... You start to understand in a system like this, in a hierarchy system and in a dysfunctional family system, for example, that you succeeding, that you being intelligent, that you having successes is actually going to threaten other people in the family and other people in the system. I think that I've always been the 18 year old girl he got engaged to, so uh, I don't think I've been given any credit for growth. And my goodness, I've had to grow. <laughs> Anything good I ever did. Nobody ever said a thing, never said well done, or was it okay? But if I tripped up, which invariably I did, because I was new at the game, a ton of bricks came down on me. Well, obviously there were lots of tears, and one could dive into the bulimia and to escape. If somebody has talent, if somebody is quite charismatic, if somebody is quite good and likeable, the system, the system realises that in the future this person could be a problem, too much of a problem. So they learn to kind of dim that. They need to crush that and fast. In 1987, they were apart for three months. Charles ignored press reports until the Queen intervened. He blamed the chill in the marriage on Diana's illness. That was Charles's, Charles's great downfall, was, but was the belief that he, he could actually put out one kind of his, uh, one uh, view of his character, that this was the man who was the loving, caring man for nursing the wife through a a very difficult period of time when in fact the truth was totally different and he actually believed that he could get away with it. I was at the end of my tether. I was desperate. I think I was so fed up with being seen as someone who was a basket case because I am a very strong person and I know that causes complications in the system that I live in. How would a book change that? Maybe people have a better understanding. Maybe there's a lot of women out there who suffer 
on the same level but in a different environment who are unable to stand up for themselves because their self-esteem is cut into two. I don't Charles's office continued to undermine Diana's credibility. We were being told that uh, Charles and Diana were trying to get their life back together again and this was after the Andrew Morton book had first revealed uh, Diana's worries about Camilla and before the actual breakup so they were due to go on a royal tour of Korea and uh, we were asked to hold off any kind of criticism of Charles and Diana meanwhile the spin doctors at the palace were saying that Charles was trying to help Diana through this very difficult period of time that she was having and that uh, all this uh, uh, fantasy that she was having about Camilla being uh, Charles's mistress was subject with the problem of her illness and her bulimia. So they were all bad mouthing her like mad. A scheduled royal visit to Korea in early November 1992 went ahead, but the tour was a mistake. The couple offended their hosts with their personal animosity towards one another. Quite simply, Charles and Diana could not stand each other's presence. It was the most disastrous public relations exercise and it was quite clear that the two loathed each other. I mean, you only look at the pictures and they were called the glums and all sorts of awful things. We decided that the time was to come out and say that this is actually the truth of this relationship, that uh, all the bad mouthing of Diana and the alleged fantasy of Camilla, she was in fact true, was, was in fact true and that she was right and that the palace were putting out the most terrible smokescreen. Um, no doubt they, they didn't believe it, but um, that uh, Charles in fact had been doing all the things that Diana said. Diana turned out to be not the brainless bimbo that he thought he'd married, but a thoroughly modern woman who stamped her foot publicly and became a potent icon for feminists suddenly. Wife the Prince of Wales, I was a problem, full stop, never happened before. What do we do with her? Against mm. her. She won't go quietly, that's the problem. I'll fight till the end. I think every strong woman in history has had to walk down a similar path. It's the strength that causes the confusion and the fear. Why is she strong? Where does she get it from? Where is she taking it? Where is she going to use it? By the time that Diana died, and in fact, I'm afraid, a few years before, the royal family had really given up on Diana. They found her a complete and utter menace, was a threat to the throne. She had her court which was becoming more and more powerful, really, she was taking on the royal family. But you have to remember that unless you are born into that family, you are of royal blood, you are always totally expendable in their eyes. They are utterly ruthless, the Windsors. They will get rid of people, and that includes people who marry into them, like that. They are not that important. What circumstances the Princess of Wales feared for her life. In October 1996, in a letter to her butler, Princess Diana expressed the fear that she would die in a car crash and it wouldn't be an accident. The Princess had written me a letter and in that letter she said in her own handwriting on her own stationery her words were the next few months are the most difficult in my life. I fear that my husband is planning an accident in my car, dash head injuries, in order that he can remarry. And at the inquest, the coroner read out a note of a conversation Diana had in 1995 with her solicitor, the late Lord Mishcon. I told HRH that if she really believed her life was being threatened, security measures, including relating to her car, must be increased. I frankly could not believe that what I was hearing could be credible as to this alleged conspiracy, and sought a private word with Commander Jeffson, who surprisingly said he himself half believed in the accuracy of what HRH had said. Play. And by going in with Dodie Fayed and falling in love with him, as I believe she absolutely did, head over heels with the guy, you've got the ultimate cocktail 
of danger for the British establishment. I was told that when it was announced that she was dead that day in August, there was a great sigh of relief around the entire royal family. I think most of the British public still believe it was dodgy. I believe Mohammed al Fayed will always believe it's dodgy. I believe the establishment wanted all to just go away for whatever reason. And I don't know the answers to these questions. All I know is that the inquest has probably raised more questions than in the end it answered. And it answered a lot of questions.